Welcome back to another episode of the Overwatch League News Recap. While not a ton of stuff has been made official just yet, free agency has begun. In this episode, we'll be highlighting the contract status of every team's roster, plus some other interesting events that have happened since the last episode. I hope you're all excited as I am for this. Let's get into it. Back on Monday, the League put out their yearly article which tells you exactly who is and isn't on their respective teams anymore, and a link to that will be provided in the description. I for one do not plan to go over every single individual player or team, but instead tend to focus on certain points of interest just to keep things flowing. So let's go down the list, shall we? I wanted to start things off with the Atlanta Reign. What I find interesting about them is how only the Western players have a new or existing deal with the exception of Pelican. Rumor has it that the Reign plan to go fully Western very soon, so their current free agents leaving makes a lot of sense. Pelican is also supposedly on the trade block, and we're kind of just waiting for someone to win the bidding war for him, so that kind of sets up all of the building blocks to make these rumors potentially true. And now we know for a fact that both Iris and Edison are not returning after the official goodbye post that happened on Atlanta's Twitter. I have to admit that I'm a little disappointed by all of this. I thought the mixed roster they were fielding was pretty sick. I can't say anything for certain, but from what I can tell, Pelican probably wanted to be traded if I had to take a guess based off of that one post that Coach Sefi made. That really hurts when considering that Pelican was the carry of this team in 2021. However, I'm not exactly sure what's going on with everybody else. Did this team choose to go fully Western the moment this offseason began? Was this planned, or was this something they decided to do after Pelican maybe requested a trade? I don't know if that's how it worked or if that's what went down, but that's what I'm assuming. It's very interesting to think about this from the perspective of an outsider like myself and most of you watching. Either way, it kind of sucks because the likes of Pelican and even Iris were disgustingly good. I can't say that I'm totally happy with where this team is moving, but that appears to be their current status based off of their players contracts as well as the rumor swirling around. I'm curious to see where some of their rookie talent now ends up going. Somebody like Iris, for example, is likely to draw some eyes because he had a roll star level year, at least in my opinion. I can't believe that yet another elite caliber flex support is set to become a free agent. This list is getting out of hand. Like a lot of other guys entering free agency, I would say there's quite a few specific teams who can make good use from a guy like Iris. You've got the Spark, maybe the Outlaws, Uprising, Justice, NYXL, Charge. Iris has some crazy competition but I think luckily for him at least, there's a lot of different options out there in terms of teams either looking for a new flex support or to upgrade their current position, period. Iris better find a new team, man, because he had such a great year. Seeing his talents go to waste would be tragic. Looking at Edison and his status, I could totally see him getting another shot too. He played more of a secondary role on this year's Atlanta team, but that's only because Kai and Pelican were so darn good. Edison has great potential, and I believe a fresh start where he plays more of a role could see him thrive. Throw him on like Guangzhou or Boston to play some hit scan and see what happens, because Edison, he's not bad. After the hype he was getting at the start of 2020, this better not be the last we see of him. He deserves another opportunity to live up to his crazy potential. As we move on to the Chengdu Hunters now, they still have everybody except for Among and Late Young as we've talked about previously. All of their DPS and supports as of this moment are untouched. All of their main playmakers appear to be coming back, which is a great sign. Their current roster is generally pretty satisfactory, but I think an upgrade at like DPS or something definitely would not hurt. I'd like to see somebody aside from Jin Moon Leaf be consistently reliable because I'm not entirely sure if Jimmy and or Taro Cookie could provide that. Something else to make Maybe think about is the tank situation now that Gaga is the only guy left there. This is a team that needed to make a move or two to be in excellent shape, so hopefully they make some announcements very soon. Another team that caught my interest was the Hangzhou Spark. We already knew who was leaving based off of last week, but now we know for a fact that everybody else is safe. Shy, unsurprisingly, got his option exercised. This dude is a god-tier DPS who you can build your future around, so good on the spark. I'm a bit more curious about Architect, though. That one, I don't really know. While I'm a big fan of this guy, and I think he's great, I kind of figured the spark might have been interested in moving on after two years of working together and maybe just starting over. But again, Architect, based off of what we've seen in the past, has a ridiculously high ceiling, so I suppose it makes sense to bring him back at least for one more season. Speaking of making sense, it's good to see all of their tanks coming back. Gushui is the OG and fan favorite, so him staying is kind of a given. What's a bit more interesting, though, is the decision to hold on to both off tanks. While I do think both of them could be good, 
I don't know if it's good to have them both back on the team. Maybe it's just me, but that's kind of weird, and I don't know if it's necessary. But I suppose that since Bernard's back, it's all good. That's the main thing to really think about. The big thing Hongzhou really need to focus on, though, is the support line. The free agent support class that we have this year is ridiculously good. There's so many great options, especially at flex. Getting a Jonak or Twilight level player would be really nice, and I truly do hope that the Spark go big here because they need it desperately if they're looking to turn things around. How about the Outlaws, though? We knew about a lot of their free agents already, but I do not believe we were aware of the status involving Dante. Before making this video, he was entering free agency, his contract did expire, but it would seem that the Outlaws have already re-signed him, which is great, and it makes a lot of sense. I think that Dante likes playing there, and now that the Outlaws are good, he has more of a reason to stay. Well, I mean, they might not be as good next year. We don't know what's going to happen with them, but they were good. They seem like they're heading in a better direction, so it makes sense that Dante would decide that it's in his best interest to come back. Part of me thought, at least for a little bit before this announcement came out, that Dante might want to end up leaving the Outlaws because they are changing so much after all, but also, he might just want to explore his other options out there because a lot of teams would bound to have interest in him, and you never know, maybe he'd maybe want to go play with some of his friends from the US, you know? So yeah, it's good that Dante is back with the Outlaws. He's kind of the face of this franchise at this point, and he's a superstar caliber player on top of it. When looking at the Outlaws from a more general perspective now, it's crazy to think that they only have two players under contract here at the start of free agency. It truly makes you wonder what Houston's plan is going to be moving forward, as a lot of guys have already announced to not be coming back. Recently, Crimzo, Happy, and Dreamer all parted ways with the team as well. It's honestly a shame, because I thought that Crimzo, he had such a great year in 2021. Either Houston has a new direction they plan to go in, or Crimzo found a new opportunity he simply could not refuse. Where that would be exactly, I'm not too sure. Maybe he wants to play from home in Vancouver or Toronto or something. Either way, he made it clear in his goodbye tweet that some sort of door has opened up. Thinking about happy status, he's a weird one. When he's feeling it, he is one of the best hits games in the game. We saw that happen in the first few weeks of the year, as well as in previous years. But after that, the inconsistencies this guy is known for just come into effect. It's like clockwork. He's like the kind of guy you want to have for certain moments, but then on the bench for others. I'm not exactly sure how to explain it. Would I maybe like to have seen Happy get one more chance with Houston? Yes. But it's an understandable departure if you're looking for consistency. In terms of where Happy could go, I would argue his options are rather open. He's not the most consistent player in the world, but DPS and strong mechanics seem like they're going to be a big focus point for Overwatch 2 as that position becomes more valuable, so I would not be surprised if he gets a new opportunity. The common theory I've heard is Dallas, but you can't rule out like Boston or even a potential return to Guangzhou either. Then of course there's Dreamer, and I'm super sad about this one as well because I prayed that Houston would consider keeping him, but I guess it wasn't meant to be. For some reason, I can really see Dreamer maybe going to Boston. He seems like the kind of veteran Boston would like to get their hands on. He's likely a more affordable option with good flexibility. But who knows, maybe even like Seoul, Philly, or one of the Canadian teams is on the table. There's good landing spots for Dreamer for sure, but whether anyone has interest at this point is kind of up in the air. From my current perspective, I feel like it makes sense for the Outlaws to move on from so many of these players just because a lot of other teams are kind of doing the same thing, but at the same time, a lot of these guys made for a solid core, and this Outlaws team really came out of nowhere, so maybe you'd want to build on something like that, but I guess not. Could this end up sucking from an Outlaws standpoint? Maybe. This franchise literally just got out of the mediocre zone, and I think it would be a shame both for the fans and this franchise as a whole to get back into that status again if things do not go their way during this offseason. Next on the list, we have the LA Gladiators, and they're a major talking point right now because half of their starters are back, which is great. They've got Kevster, Shu, and Skewed, but now Space and Moth have entered free agency. And from the looks of it, Space does have clear interest in potentially coming back, but we cannot say the same for Moth as his contract option straight up got declined, and there's a good chance that Moth and or the Glads wanted to separate. Moth's leadership is incredibly valuable, and he definitely was dependable when the team played him, but as the season went on, we just saw less and less of the guy. Brigitte became really popular, and that allowed Skewed to show off his potential. He showed off so much of said potential that the Glads might see him as their full-time main support option moving forward now. 
When it was all said and done, Moth played less than skewed. The Glad should not have to spend big money on somebody they'll only use like half of the time. Unless Moth intends to retire, it makes sense that he'd want to leave this team and seek a new opportunity. Moth is one of the best support players to ever touch this game. He's been a part of rotations for the last two years, basically. The guy has gone through more than his fair share of this stuff. It's time for him to be a full-time starter. Any team that likes to have Western players on their team will probably at least think about Moth joining their team. I think maybe like he could go to the Fusion, maybe the Shock want to bring him back. The options are on the table if Moth is not retiring. Moving on to space, like I said earlier, I think he is a bit more likely to come back, but you definitely still have to worry about this as a Glads fan, because something I thought about the other day is what if maybe, you know, Space wants to get out of LA? He's never played outside of it before. Four years of that sounds like it could get pretty old. Perhaps a move is something he's highly considering. Kind of like with Dante, his decision very well might come down to what some of these other American players decide to do. If they're all trying to team up, Space might feel inclined to join them as it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I, for one, though, think the Gladiators are Indy's number one option. He's used to this environment. It's a system that he knows how to flourish under, and the fans love him there. It's going to be very interesting to see what Space decides to do. On the topic of LA teams, the Valiant, unsurprisingly, are starting over yet again. The rumors of this being a temporary thing are basically confirmed at this point. They were just trying to get through this year. Now it's about where they go from here, though. Are the Immortals going to attempt to redeem themselves with some kind of Western roster where they don't screw over the players? That would be a nice first step, I would say. Although, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to a better Chinese roster either, because China has a wealth of talent who likely won't even get a chance since most teams don't look towards this region. The Valiant could be like a mini Chengdu Hunters of sorts if they play their cards right. No matter what they do, though, I think that anything is better than what we got in 2021. I mean, there's literally nowhere to go but up. Next on my list of interesting teams is the Philly Fusion. The thing to point out with them is their commitment to Carpe and Alarm. They intend to stay loyal to their stars, which is admirable. Carpe in particular is pretty crazy when considering he's been with the Fusion since day one. It's cool to see a legend of the game stick with his original team as we enter a new era. Is it necessarily the correct decision, though? I for one think moving on from the past might be the way to go, but if the Fusion build their team right, then maybe it'll work out. The thing to look out for is if they go fully Korean or not, with EQO, Shockwave, Funny Astro, and Poco all officially not coming back, now might be the time to make something like this happen. I personally felt like Philly were at one of their highest points last year when they went full Korean. This honestly might be the play. I think maybe they should give it a try. Maybe the Fusion could form the next Korean super team. Imagine if they like traded for Yaki or Pelican, then picked up Smurf and a few other crazy pieces. That would make for an emphatic retooling process, and I would love to see it happen. Another team of interest for me is absolutely the San Francisco Shock. Last week, we discussed the dropping of seven players, but as it turns out, those were not the only free agents because both Super and Choi Yobin have expiring contracts as well, which means that Violet currently is the lone survivor of the Season 4 roster and the Championship Core from 2019 and 2020. Two of the most iconic tanks in the league could be leaving the shock for good. Rumor has it that Choi, at the very least, is set to retire, but Super's a bit more up in the air. If I'm being honest, I kind of expected this to be the other way around, because Super retiring to pursue streaming just seems like a likely outcome to me. But at the end of the day, it's important to remember that Choi has been around for quite some time. He's far from the only legend who made this kind of decision this year. I honestly cannot believe it still. So many big personalities from the shock are set to move on. That championship core is dead. It's just up to Violet now. Super in particular was basically the face of this franchise, so that has to hurt if he's officially leaving. Now it's all up to Violet. This is his team. The Shock management is free to build around him in any way they see fit. If there's any good news to have as a Shock fan, though, it's that you at the least still have a top support in the league, right? It's not much considering you don't have a team besides him, but it's better than nothing. Now we're all here left wondering what the Shock's decision-making process will be. Is it time for a rebuild centered around rookie talent? Are they thinking about rookies at all for that matter? Or are they taking that aggressive rebuild panic approach where they feel like they have to win now after not getting the 3 P? 
Regardless of what the plan may be, I suspect that the Shock could be delivering in a big way. Given this org's reputation and having the opportunity to play under Coach Krusty, I think that free agents are automatically going to gravitate towards their direction. Moving on is never easy, but a fresh start could see this team come back in a big way depending on who they pick up. I know that the Shock are really scared right now, and I think their fans are too, but I for one am really hyped to see how they respond to all of this because there's great opportunities ahead of them. Let's move over to the Seoul Dynasty now. Along with their roster status, they made a good number of announcements. I think the first thing that all Seoul fans probably want to know about is profit and fit. Well, all of you can now breathe a collective sigh of relief because the dynamic duo is sticking around at least for one more year, which is excellent news. They were quite easily one of the most consistent DPS duos in Season 4. Building your future around them is definitely the right idea. On top of that, Soul decided to bring back Creative, which will probably get more mixed reactions within the community. Creative, he's a decent player with a pretty high ceiling and he definitely had his moments this year. But at the same time, his impact just wasn't the same as that 2020 playoff run, you know? He was a below average player statistically on multiple flex support heroes. And when you think about how crazy this free agency class is at his position, you can't help but question why the Dynasty wouldn't consider moving on. Just imagine if Soul decided to sign Twilight or Iris. That's an insta upgrade and you cannot tell me otherwise. But who knows? Maybe Soul still end up signing one of these guys, then transition creative to like a backup role of some sort. That's my current copium of the situation. But yeah, aside from that, the Dynasty so-called aggressive rebuild is holding up to be true as Animo, Gesture, Marvel, Tuyu, and Sabiobi are all gone. While I was kind of hoping they'd maybe hold on to Tuyu, the general decision making here is good. The tank situation was generally unstable this year and in 2020. They absolutely needed some fresh faces in there for sure, and luckily for them, a few good options present themselves like Smurf and Muse just to name a few examples. That would be a great first step to take. Change can be a scary thing if you're a soul fan, but trust me when I say that it could definitely be worth the initial stress. I'm kinda hoping that Marvel, Tuyu, and Animo at the very least all make it back to the league though. I think that Animo, he simply just wasn't a good long-term option for the Soul team. He was a good scheme fit with their old core due to their patient and passive nature, but now that the tanks are changing and they want to go with this aggressive rebuild of sorts, that presents a potential rebrand in their style of play. Generally speaking, I for one thought that Animo was decent this year. Not incredible, but also not bad, so I kind of have high hopes that he can find a new team as a veteran presence of sorts. Thinking about Marvel, this dude at his peak was an incredible main tank. Season 2 Marvel, and I stand by this, is one of the most criminally underrated players in League history. Maybe a new team is going to find interest in somebody like Marvel, and a fresh start could help him get back on the right track. As for Tuyu, I think he's the exact type of new talent that teams are going to be looking for. Yeah, he's been a part of Seoul for a bit now, but this was really his first full year in the league, and he generally has a lot of promise. Throw him on like a New York or a Vancouver or something, and I think he could end up being a pretty decent player for you. Maybe not the full-time starter, but definitely a good rotational piece depending on what the meta is. I'll leave it up to you in terms of what teams might be interested in those three players. In regards to Gesture and Sabiobi, this is the end of their careers as they both decided to retire, and this is a very emotional time. Both of them deserve some praise as they move on to the next chapter of their lives. I get that they weren't that great here in 2021, but these guys are still legends of pro Overwatch. Their history is rich, and it goes all the way back to 2017. Think about Gesture on GC Busan and SBB on LW Blue and in the World Cup. These two have been making their mark on the game for years now. Their unique personalities and clutch performances can never be forgotten. Gesture is a multi-time champion. His Winston and his Arissa are iconic. I didn't get to see much of him before the league started, but god did I love watching this dude at arguably his peak in 2018. He was a top tier main tank during this time for sure, and on top of that, this dude has incredible swag. I mean, he oozed confidence when coming out on stage. Despite my criticisms in recent years, I recognize that his contributions and achievements are pretty big. What's wild about Gesture's departure, though, is that it marks the end of him and Prophet's run together. From 2017 until 2021, these two have always played together. It's going to be weird seeing them separated, and I can't even begin to imagine how tough it's going to be on Prophet emotionally. Then there's Sabiobi. 
Oh, SBB, I'm gonna miss you a lot, dude. Captain Clutch, as I liked to call him back in the day, was a true inspiration. From LW Blue to the NYXL, SBB established himself as an all-time great. His time on the Season 1 NYXL especially sticks out. Those boys did not win a title. But wow, I mean, wow were they fun to watch. And at the helm of all of their regular season success was SBB. It goes without question that he is easily one of the finest leaders in the history of this game. Never have I ever seen somebody bring so much energy to a roster while also being their true leader and captain. He always knew how to get his team pumped up and he always knew the right time to. I can still vividly recall the times where he'd get up out of his chair at the end of the round mid-game to fist bump every single one of his teammates and get them hyped up. Or what about that time that he held Flower's hand as they were about to get swept by the shock in the playoffs? Sabiobi is a class act. He cared so much about those around him. He's a genuine human being, a god-tier leader, a great husband, and of course, the OG number one tracer in the world. I can never forget that time he said that after winning the Stage 3 Finals against the Boston Uprising, or just the general pop-offs throughout Season 1. When your team needed somebody to bail you out and you had SBB on your team, you already knew that he had your back. And this carries over across all teams he's played for, I guess with the exception of Seoul since he never touched the stage. New York is absolutely the first team to come to mind. He's kind of iconic with that franchise at this point, but I for one can never forget about the 2017 World Cup either. During that time when he played for South Korea was when I actually first learned of his existence, and boy did he leave a great impression on me as he popped off and destroyed my hopes and dreams as a Team USA supporter on the way to a gold medal just a few days later. I wish that this guy could have stuck around for a bit longer, but now was probably the right time to go, and he recognized this as stated in his twit longer. Things are never going to be the same without Sabiobi. GG man, and good luck with whatever comes next. You're going to kill it. Before moving on from Seoul, we've got some news in their coaching department. After two years of questionable decision making and lots of people calling for his job, Cheng Goon is finally out as the head coach. And this is arguably bigger news than the player departures because, again, a lot of fans have kind of wanted him out for quite some time. This is pretty major stuff. In my opinion, he absolutely had to go. After all the weird lineups and compositions and decisions that he's made throughout the years, something had to change. I genuinely believe that Seoul can do better. Anything is better than what they've been dealing with the last couple of years. My preferred coach of choice would be one who instills more aggressive ideals into their players. Profit and Fitz are such incredible playmakers, and I think Seoul need to make the most out of that. But for the time being, we're kind of just left in the dark as Seoul makes some big-time choices over the next couple of months. As we continue down the list of teams, we come across the next bit of major news here at the start of free agency. The Vancouver Titans have declined all of their players' team options and did not renew any expiring contracts. Vancouver are ready to start off fresh yet again. And after the last two years, you really can't blame them. They tried more of a slow, contenders development approach alongside some veterans, but it just didn't take them anywhere. Not to sound cold, but not many people are going to be upset over this news. The Titans needed a redo. I'm still a little sad to see like Dalton in particular without a home for the time being because I still think he is very capable, but overall, there's no reason to really complain. They were mediocre from top to bottom, if not below average, and I think the fans have had just about enough of that for the last couple of years. A lot of other teams are looking to start over, so I think if you're the Titans, you kind of have to deliver and do the same for the sake of your fans. Week 1 of 2020 was the real last time this franchise had any sort of real relevance. Let's get a full-on rebuild going. They can take literally whatever direction they want to. If young talent is mainly still the answer, that's totally fine. You've got some pretty hype players coming from just about every single region, and that could be a great starting point they need for a successful rebuild this time around. Unlike what they had to do in 2020 where it was kind of just in a panic, they've got time. But honestly, as cool as it would be to get a bunch of the upcoming stars out of contenders, I for one am kind of hoping the Titans go with an aggressive approach this time. Imagine if they made some kind of Korean redeem team or something, but this time there is not some sort of big time disagreement. That would be sick. It's been far too long since this franchise has been taken seriously, and now is the time to get it going. It's a new game, and a new roster gives you a serious chance at life. But of course, it's worth noting that I do not know the ins and outs of Vancouver's current situation, nor do I know if they're even in a position to spend a lot of money in the first place right now. These are mainly just hopeful thoughts. In the meantime, there's seven more Season 4 veterans potentially seeking new homes. I know for a fact that Dalton, Fried Wiener, Taro, and Changsik are all looking for new teams, but I'm not entirely sure about the others just yet. 
While I want to see some of these guys succeed, I'd be lying to you if I said that any of them would be super great pickups, nor do they have great odds of getting picked up. None of these guys are what you'd consider premier talents, and they just might not be worth it in comparison to a lot of these big name free agents and upcoming rookies. In my opinion, the person with top odds is probably Dalton. He showed off decent skills on a bad team, and I think that if you give him some better resources, he could be a somewhat valuable hit scan or rotational piece. If the Mayhem, let's say, are going full Western, maybe they could give Dalton a shot. Or if Paris are willing to sign NA talent, then maybe that's another place he could go. The options are there for Dalton, but it's worth noting they are limited. And this kind of applies to everybody else who we know for a fact is LFT. Fire, Rolf, and Lynx are on the other hand, they're undetermined determined as far as I'm concerned. I'm pretty sure Lynx or Seti's LFT, but for any opportunity, so I'm not exactly sure what to make of that. But I doubt that any of those guys would find a new team and want new and exciting, and none of those guys really fit the bill. And finally, the last team we have to talk about in their statuses is the Washington Justice. Now, these guys did their contracts right. They kept their tank line and their primary DPS. They have a clear path that they're trying to take. Washington have a foundation. They've got high potential, young talent, and superstars. Build around the four main guys from last year, but also get a much better support line, and boom, I think this team becomes a lot better instantly. Like I've said numerous times the last few weeks, the Justice have abundant options currently. Go and reunite Mag with Gangnam Jin. Maybe pick up Jonek for some better aggression. Or better yet, reunite Slime and Twilight for a super aggro and dynamic support line who also have runaway roots. This team could literally become Runaway plus Decay and Fury, and that sounds pretty decent on paper. Support is the primary objective, but another DPS probably wouldn't hurt either just because of Assassin's inconsistencies from 2021. If the Justice can work on that plus the support thing, they're in great shape arguably. They've got their core in place already, plus a small upgrade at coaching, so as a result, I have high hopes that the Justice can bounce back strong in 2022 if they do have a productive offseason. Now for a couple of miscellaneous coaching things before we wrap up. First up is Christopher becoming the new head coach of the London Spitfire. Given his roots to the fusion and being English or British, I guess you could say, I totally understand why this would happen. The man's been working his butt off for this exact type of opportunity. He has a lot of experience as a coach at this point, and I think that him and Spillo might come up with something good for 2022. If not, hopefully it's better than what we saw this year. Beating a one-win season ain't asking for a lot. The thing is, though, I'm not entirely sure if Chris was the best option. Again, I think he definitely does deserve an opportunity, but I kind of wish the Spitfire got get amazed, seeing as he already proved himself at the head coaching level. But oh well, coaching is only one piece of the puzzle after all. Upgrading the roster is just as important. So for now, I'll give this decision the opportunity to pan out before making a proper judgment. On the topic of the fusion, they parted ways with Coach 9K, who they apparently really wanted to keep. He did a decent job under some not so great circumstances and had a great reputation, so it's not hard to see why. But supposedly, 9K wanted out, so there's not much they can really do about that, and that's a tough loss. But Philly seems to have moved on quickly as they already announced the signing of former Guangzhou charge coach Jin as their new head coach. Since leaving the league during the previous offseason, he spent time in Korean contenders coaching T1, aka the Fusions Academy team. Whether this was the best signing or not doesn't really matter in the slightest because, again, he kind of already has the Fusion connections in place. But to be fair, he also does have a decent resume. The Charge did have their moments during Season 3, and since taking over T1, the team got a top 4 and top 3 finish in Korean contenders. And that's not shabby at all. Maybe another chance is what he needs to right his wrongs. I feel like KDG kind of did a similar thing back in the day when he went from Seoul to Philly. Jin was definitely not a top guy I was thinking of for Philly to replace 9K with, but hey, they needed to make some aggressive changes. It's the only way if they want to break the cycle of misery. Coaching is probably not all that high on the priority list, but still, you never know where things could end up going from something like this, and I guess we'll find out if it was worth it soon enough. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's another off-season recap in the bag. Nothing too crazy has gone down since the previous episode, but we'll get there soon enough. In the meantime, let me know what you think of the news discussed in today's video in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video and want to keep up with the series, giving this video a like and dropping a sub would definitely help. Thank you all so much for watching today's video. I appreciate your support so much. And until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.